Das Kultursymposium Weimar des Goethe-Instituts ist schon in zwei Wochen und mit dabei wird die Journalistin Anna P. Santos sein. Ihr Thema sind Care-Workerinnen, die sich tausende von Kilometern von zu Hause entfernt um fremde Kinder und fremde Alte kümmern, um so das Überleben der Familie zu Hause zu sichern. Anna P. Santos beobachtet da das Heranwachsen einer mutterlosen Generation. Von den Philippinen in die USA. Unter dem Titel Haircuts and Social Justice blickt das Kultursymposium Weimar auf den Friseursalon Project Q in Downtown Los Angeles. Hier treffen sich verschiedene Generationen queerer AktivistInnen, um ihre Erfahrungen zu diskutieren. Rund um Black Lives Matter, Diskriminierungserfahrungen und Strategien der Selbstermächtigung. Der heutige Beitrag nimmt uns mit nach Indien und da geht es um von Generation zu Generation vererbte Traumata. Mit der Teilung des indischen Subkontinents unter britischer Herrschaft 1947 bricht eine Welle der Gewalt los. 14 Millionen Menschen, Hindus, Muslime, Sikhs werden vertrieben, über eine Million Menschen ermordet. Das Goethe-Institut Neu-Delhi bringt AktivistInnen und ForscherInnen zusammen, um die Folgen dieses kollektiven Traumas zu diskutieren und zu klären, wie sich solche Traumata auf die folgende Generation und auch auf die gesamte Gesellschaft auswirken. Die gesamte Diskussion und alle Statements von Urvashi Butalia, Sanjeev Jai, Sudhir Kakar, Amrita Narayanan und Haimanti Roy findet ihr auch in der Mediathek. Und jetzt drei Statements vorab. Looking at partition becomes difficult because there are no easily identifiable aggressors and victims. In many ways we are all complicit in perpetrating the violence or in remaining silent about it and to address that kind of trauma is that much more difficult. Violence engulfed and affected large groups. It targeted women as symbols of their families, communities and their nations. Targeting women was a new phenomenon for the subcontinent. Succeeding generations of survivors of trauma can be deeply affected by something that did not directly happen to them. Good morning. I'm glad to be part of this important discussion on intergenerational trauma. This is not a subject we deal with much in India. I mean, therapists and counselors may deal with it in their work, but on a day-to-day -day basis, it's not something that forms part of everyday discourse. And yet I think it is a really important subject for us to deal with because there are so many unresolved moments in our history that we need to address. But the question that really arises is, how in a society that is as polarized as ours and that is as hierarchical as ours, do you start to talk about this important subject and what does it mean? Let me give you an example from Kashmir, the part of um, South Asia that both India and Pakistan have argued over since the moment that we became independent. Um, in the year 1991, several decades ago, in two villages in Kashmir called Kunan and Poshpora, the army carried out what is called a search and seizure operation, seeking out militants who they thought may be hidden or hiding in the village and may have been kept in hiding by the villagers. So just to give a bit of explanation, Kashmir is a state, although it's no longer now a state, but it's a part of India that comes under a law which creates a state of exception and gives the army that is there special powers to do this kind of search and seizure operation. And militants in Kashmir at one point were often local young men and local boys. So the army went into this village late at night on February 23rd, 1991 to seek out young militants they thought may be hidden or hiding in the village. In the process, it is believed that maybe 30 to 40 women were raped by army soldiers. And this case then went to court after allegations of rape surfaced. 
But over the years, nothing much happened, and slowly it kind of just petered out. But the consequences were amazing because the daughters, the women from that village, for many, many years, they could not marry or they could not find husbands because the village itself came to be known as the village of raped women. And given the kind of stigma that sexual violence carries in our society, it wasn't surprising to see that people, men would not want to marry women from there. So in some ways, the trauma faced by the mothers was inherited by their daughters. Many, many years later, after this incident had faded from public memory, recently, in the last 10 years, a group of young women, all in their 20s, not related in any way to the women of Kunan Poshpora, except by also being Kashmiri themselves, looked at a case of sexual assault in Delhi and decided to re-explore their own history. And they succeeded in reopening discussions on the case, reopening proceedings on the case. And in doing so, they continued the search for justice and healing and honored the women who were their ancestors. So, here you see two kinds of intergenerational things happening. One is that the direct descendants of the women who face the trauma actually um, suffer the consequences of that. And the other is how subsequent generations who take this as their history try to begin processes of healing. And I think both of those are extremely important. Now, I myself am not an expert on intergenerational trauma of any kind. Uh, but I have worked on a moment in our history, in the history of India, which was a moment of deep uh, suffering for millions and millions of people. And that is the partition of India in 1947, the moment when India became independent and was simultaneously partitioned in a bloody uh, partition which killed millions of people. As a child growing up in young India, I was born five years after partition. Uh, I grew up with some knowledge of partition, but it was always very partial. What we learned about in school was about political leaders and political parties, but we heard very little about what happened to people. My own family was a family deeply divided by partition, and yet as a young person growing up, I remained indifferent to these stories. It was only much later that these stories started coming home to me. And then I began work on interviewing people to listen to their stories of what had happened at the time and discovered how these stories simultaneously inhabit a sphere of speech and silence. That they remain silenced or they did remain silenced in wider society. But in the communities from which people came, in the families to which they belonged, they talked about these things all the time. And I want to tell you one such story about this. I met a man called Bir Bahadur Singh, who I interviewed for on several occasions or over a longish period of time. And he told me this terrible history, that he was 11 years old when partition happened. The villages to which he belonged, a cluster of villages, were under sustained attack. And at some point, all people gathered inside the Gurdwara, the Sikh temple, in the hope that banding together might bring them some safety in numbers. But when it became clear that the attacks were imminent, the elders consisting of men and women got together and decided first that they would kill the women and children of their own community in order to, within quotes, save them and save their honor from being violated by men of the other community. Bir Bahadur stood in the Sikh temple and watched his father kill his 16-year-old sister. How does an 11-year-old boy carry this memory into his adult life for years and years afterwards? And it wasn't only this thing. Another thing happened. Shortly after the incident where men killed their own children, sometimes their wives, it is said that about 85 women in that same cluster decided to take their own lives by jumping into a nearby well. Bir Bahadur's mother was one of those women. She did not die. 
in the end, she survived. And for this young man growing up in India, what he carried with him was the trauma of seeing the violence done to his sister and others, the fear of losing his mother, the, um, I suppose, happiness or relief at not having lost her, but also very complicated feeling of being cheated by the survival of his mother, of the kind of um, ta tag of being the family of a martyr. Because she did not die, the family was not fully, realistically, theoretically a martyr's family. So all of these things are uh, things that um, our society has carried with it through into um, the present day, and these things remain unaddressed in many ways. So while Bir Bahadur's story is at least available to us, we really have no way of knowing what those women who jumped into the well what they thought, what went through their minds, how do we recover their experience? And we have very little way of finding out what their children, who are scattered all over, would have inherited of this story. So similarly, it is by now widely known that at the time of partition, thousands of women uh, were subjected to sexual assault and sexual violence. So while today in our society, because of the conditions around us and because of the intervention of many young researchers, we are beginning to hear more of these stories, it is almost too late for many of them because most of the survivors have gone. But also the question of sexual violence remains one that we don't as yet have answers to. Because for women who underwent sexual violence, how to speak about a subject for which there is no vocabulary in a society that hardly addresses the subject of sex, let alone sexual violence, and how to speak about that experience and hand down that knowledge to the next generation in a way that the next generation is not ashamed of their mothers. Because as I said, when I spoke about Kashmir, and Kunan Poshpura, sexual violence carries such a lot of stigma with it, which is uh, sticks to the victim, the survivor. So how will their families, the generations that come, deal with it? And often in my work on partition, I was requested by survivors of sexual violence when I did speak to them to not tell their stories in such a way that they could be identified. In fact, years ago, I found a book um, a government publication which listed in it the names of thousands of women who had gone through sexual violence. And till today, as a researcher and a writer, I have not had the courage to publicize that. Because the question is, what is good about this speech or silence? To whom do we owe responsibility to the survivors or to some search for truth? And this is a question that researchers are grappling with today. So there are so many things about the important subject of intergenerational trauma that we need to address, that we need to be open about. For us also, uh, looking at partition becomes difficult because it is not an easy subject. There are no easily identifiable aggressors and victims. In many ways, we are all complicit in perpetrating the violence or in remaining silent about it. And to address that kind of trauma is that much more difficult. But I think given how endemic violence and hatred are becoming in our society, I cannot emphasize enough the necessity and importance of dealing with this important subject in sensitive ways because it will not only help us to remember and to heal, but it will also help us to honor those who have gone, and it will also help us to bring justice to their memories. How do we remember and forget memories of collective and individual trauma? How do generations who have no experience of the traumatic events negotiate with post memories? In the context of South Asia, the partition of 1947 and its afterlife provides us an original template to reflect on these questions. August 1947 ushered in realities that would continue to impact the history of the South Asian subcontinent for years to come. Two new nation states, India and a divided Pakistan, 
emerged out of the political partition and the British formally quit their jewel in the crown. Punjab and Bengal, two provinces with majority Muslim populations were divided along religious lines. West Punjab and East Bengal going to Pakistan and East Punjab and West Bengal remaining in India. Pakistan received a larger share of the erstwhile Punjab and Bengal provinces, both of which would have distinct futures. In subsequent decades, West Punjab became the epicenter of the nation state of Pakistan, while East Bengal or East Pakistan broke away in 1971 to form the new nation state of Bangladesh. In effect, there were three simultaneous partitions of British India, of the province of Bengal, and of the province of Punjab. Their political and socioeconomic experiences differed depending on region, community, and class. An alternative way to think about the three partitions is to think of them conceptually as three different moments which are part of the same event. Whichever framework we choose, we find that the partition, its history, memory, and legacies don't follow a single or a straight line and did not begin and end in the year 1947. Rather, the partition unfolded over a long period of time and was a complex, often incomplete, web of political trajectories. The hallmark of the partition was its divergent experiences that depended on gender, religion, region, caste, age, and time. The act of dividing and untangling two nations was undertaken within six short months and involved high level political decisions. British officials in conjunction with All India Muslim League and the All India National Congress met behind closed doors to decide the demarcation of new international borders, the allocation of financial resources and the division of the armed forces, civil servants and bureaucratic departments. In fact, the past itself was to be partitioned as museums and their collections archives and records were divided between the two nations. The partition brought freedom to India and Pakistan, but also engendered the largest forced migration in the history of the 20th century. Between 1946 and 1965, nearly 9 million Hindus and Sikhs moved into India and approximately 5 million Muslims moved to both parts of Pakistan. The resulting massive displacement made refugee rehabilitation one of the primary agendas of in the post-1947 restructuring of India and Pakistan. However, even two months before August 1947, there was hardly anyone who could surely predict such a horrific future marked by displacement, insecurity, and trauma. That the British would leave India was certainly in the general mind but how and when was up for debate. Then why did it happen? How did the partition of British India become the only solution in 1947 agreed upon by the British, the Congress and the Muslim League? How and why did regional leaders in Bengal and Punjab support the move to divide their provinces in spite of the inevitable issues of displacement that would arise? Were there any alternatives to the partition? Most importantly, was the partition inevitable? The partition was not inevitable, but a search for causes have led generations of historians to different conclusions regarding why it happened. Some suggest that fundamental differences between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs are the root cause of the division. Some have blamed Br the British colonial rule for the gradual erosion of interwoven community identities and shared traditions. This, they argue, led to the emergence of distinct communities based on religion that had political weight. Thus, Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs demanded inclusion within distinct nations. Others find blame in the actions of major political figures of the time, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel, and Muhammad Ali Jinnah, and within the demands for a homeland for the Muslims of the subcontinent. 
Recent scholarship has persuasively overturned the argument for age-old communal differences between Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs. Rather, there is some agreement that partition happened due to more short-term political decisions, and even till the end, regional leaders in Bengal and Punjab continue to weigh different possibilities with the aim for a united India. The demand for a Muslim homeland, that is Pakistan, is often seen as a central reason for the partition. However, we know that the demand for Pakistan came not from Muslims in Bengal and Punjab, where they were a majority, but from the Northern Indian state of UP, where they were a minority. Moreover, Pakistan meant different things to different groups of Muslims, and not all of them supported the idea. For rural Bengali Muslims, Pakistan was a peasant utopia, which promised freedom from the Hindu landlord domination. For minority Muslims in UP and Bihar, it evoked the idea of a new Medina. Its geographical contours were deliberately vague to allow those who supported the concept to project their ideas onto it. Whatever the meanings and imaginings, it was only in the mid 1940s that the idea of Pakistan became synonymous with partition. While the causes of partition continue to animate public and academic discussions, the human experience of the division has become central to how we understand what happened during and after 1947. As millions moved across newly created borders, uncertain about their future, violence became a way in which such uncertainties manifested among communities. Violence engulfed and affected large groups, irrespective of caste, class, religion, and gender. Violence began with the riots in Calcutta in August 1946, then in Punjab in March 1947. It continued to rage in the immediate aftermath of 1947. It targeted women as symbols of their families, communities, and their nations. Targeting women was a new phenomenon for the subcontinent. More than 100,000 women were abducted on both sides of the border. The death toll remains disputed to this day, with figures ranging from 200,000 to a million. The experience of violence and migration differed in the North and the East. Punjab and Northern India witnessed mass violence and a swift displacement of their populations, both of which petered out by 1949. Bengal and Eastern India underwent small-scale routine violence and chronic migration patterns that lasted until 1971, when the independence of Bangladesh impacted the region differently. At one level, the horrors of partition violence were retributive to their core, as tales of trains arriving with dead bodies fuel the subsequent bouts of rioting, propaganda, tacit support of neighbors, and a desire to loot all played into an already communalized environment. At another level, the brutality of the violence can partly be explained by the presence of recently demobilized ex-soldiers of the British Indian Army who had combat experience and access to arms and ammunitions. Partition violence was also routine and small scale and individualized. In divided Bengal, violence threatened the psyche through sporadic stabbings, lootings, and destruction of properties, defacement of places of worship and verbal threats. Together, they created an ecology of fear and insecurity that engendered chronic mass migration for years to come. Partition migration changed the demographic composition of entire cities such as Lahore, Amritsar, Karachi, Delhi, and Dhaka. Why and when did people decide to move and what were their experiences of migration? How did people cope being divided across two nations? How can we access these memories of violence, the trauma of uprooting, and the experiences of refugee life? Going beyond archives, scholars have sought answers in contemporary memoirs, fictions, films, and artistic representations. Representations of the human experience of partition are immortalized in stories of writers like Sadat Hassan Manto, Ismat Chuktai, 
Bapsi Sidwa, Otin Bondapadhai, Jyoti Moi Devi, and many others. Films such as Garam Hawa and Meghe Dhakatara represented the flight of refugees and the framing of national identities. Oral interviews of survivors and perpetrators of refugees and citizens continue to provide us with significant understandings of individual experiences of partition. While in the case of the Holocaust, Marian Harsh's post memory has been an important tool in understanding the transmission of trauma through intergenerational remembering, in the case of the partition, one also has to think about such transmission through intergenerational forgetting. In India and Pakistan, we are now witnessing increasing efforts to create institutional memories through the establishment of the Partition Museum in Amritsar and the Oral History Project based out of Karachi and Lahore. Efforts to capture the generational memories of Partition are ongoing through various online portals, such as the Partition Archive based out of Berkeley, USA and Project Dastan based in the UK. Oral narratives and partition memories has drawn attention to the disjunction between nationalized histories and the personal narrative of 1947. They highlight how collective and individual memories of partition violence are mediated along caste, class, and gendered lines. In giving voice and agency to non-elite Indians and Pakistanis, such a shift has to grapple with some uncomfortable conclusions. For example, the human experiences of partition violence indicate that not everyone was a victim. Some individuals were perpetrators. While acknowledging other factors such as the role of grassroots leaders, complicity of partisan members of the police and the military, and the failure of the British colonial state to protect the people, the fact remains that partition violence pitted neighbors, friends, and communities against each other. Including human experiences also broadens the narrative of partition that had primarily concentrated on Hindus, Muslims, and Sikhs, and accounts for limited to upper caste and upper class memories. Recent histories of the partition have attempted to render those who had been invisible in the earlier narrative the untouchables or the Dalits. The focus on Dalit politics in the run-up to the partition, their experiences of migration and violence, and within the Indian state's rehabilitation efforts are significant in not only revising the erasure, but also to complicate partition's histories. History is often at odds with both official and public memory. In the case of the subcontinent, the narrative of nationhood determines and differentiates such memories depending on one's regional location. For Indians, remembering the partition means recalling the dark side of independence, a moment of loss, a moment when not only was the country divided, but families separated, exiled, and forced out of homelands into foreign lands. In contrast, Pakistanis remember 1947 as the year when a religiously informed nation, homeland, and identity were realized for minority Muslims in British India. Partition is thus framed as independence from the perceived threat of Hindu majoritarianism. The reality that not all Muslims align themselves with such an idea or move to Pakistan after 1947 detracts little from this memory of the partition. In Bangladesh, the memory of 1947 has been almost erased by the substitution of another partition, that of 1971, when East Pakistan broke away from West Pakistan and became an independent nation state. People in the subcontinent and their diaspora worldwide inhabit a world that remains profoundly shaped by the events and experiences of 1947 and its aftermath. The legacies of partition continue to impact ongoing political conflicts, frame understandings of communal relationships between Hindus and Muslims, 
and create and influence memories and stories within families who remain divided across borders. 70 years down the line, the narrative of partition is very much with us and is being actively framed not only through international diplomacy on cases such as Kashmir and Assam, but also through collective post memories and post amnesias of partition's grand and great grandchildren. Thank you. Like other important issues of our times, ecology, social media, financial markets, rise of nationalism, and the ongoing pandemic, collective violence and its traumatic consequences are also global in their scope. Many societies are seriously affected by and carry within them memories of collective violence between large groups, painful recollections passed through generations. My own memories of traumatic collective violence are from the violence between Hindus and Muslims at the partition of the country between two separate states of India and Pakistan, when tens of millions cross the newly laid boundaries in either direction as refugees and millions lost their lives. But before I come to my own takeaways on trauma and its mitigation from my personal case history, let me make some general remarks on collective trauma and its intergenerational transmission. We generally think of trauma as an overwhelming experience that our mind cannot process at the time. Psychic trauma is not what has actually happened to the child or adult. It is the mind's response to what has happened that determines the overwhelming emotions that constitute the traumatic experience and its subsequent influence. Individuals have a need for a certain amount of distance from trauma before they can begin to allow themselves to intensely re-experience the effects associated with the event or for that matter, critically reflect on their experience and create meanings for it. Some experiences are just too frightening and humiliating to remember and the survivor needs to forget it until they are ready to deal with these experiences if ever. Psychoanalysts have identified various responses to the trauma, both with individuals and in groups, before they are ready to engage with it. The various responses are, one, denial, what happened did not happen. Two, survivor guilt, why them and not us. Three, identification with the aggressor, we had it coming. Fourth, perversion of judgment. The victims were guilty and later a fascination with criminals and mass destruction. Five, a revival of catastrophes. It is the Holocaust again. Nothing will ever be the same again. And finally, six, trivialization through a proliferation and sophistication of commentaries going hand in hand with the anesthetizing of feelings. The traumatic experience that we are dealing with here, the partition of India, traumatic, is the one that cannot be contained by one generation and necessarily and largely unconsciously plays itself out through the next generation. A traumatic history doesn't have to be one's own, but might repeat or pass on the history of previous generations. As has been remarked in a different context, a baby is the only person in a family without a past. Soon enough, his parents provide him with theirs. Psychoanalysts have claimed, mostly based on the treatment of the survivors of the Holocaust and that of their children and grandchildren, that there are intergenerational secrets and unprocessed experiences that loom in our minds when unspoken events and memories of one generation haunt the next one. Succeeding generations of survivors of trauma can be deeply affected by something that did not directly happen to them. We should again remember that the impact of trauma effects on a survivor is not uniform. 
and thus the transgenerational transmission of a trauma is not inevitable. In an empirical study, Seagal and Weinfeld found evidence that Holocaust survivors had psychological and physical impairment some three and a half decades after the end of World War II. However, not all survivors were psychologically impaired. Fully 64% of the male survivors and 35% of female survivors did not give evidence of psychiatric impairment. Surprisingly, Siegel and Weinfeld found some positive long-term effects of persecution on survivors, at least based on judgments made by their offspring. There was a tendency for more positive attitudes towards family and heightened ethnic identification as Jews. Let me now come back to trauma, its generational transmission and possible mitigation through a case history. My own personal experience of the partition trauma. I was nine years old at that time and we lived in Rohtak, a small town west of Delhi. As the killings and lootings raged uncontrolled in the villages and towns of Punjab, more and more members of my father's extended family poured into Rohtak as refugees from Lahore, where they had lived for many generations and which now lay in the freshly created state of Pakistan. The rooms and verandas of our house became sprawling dormitories with mats and dharis spread close to each other as uncles, aunts and cousins of varying degrees of kinship lived and slept in intimate confusion. With the loss of their homes and places of work, with the snapping of long-standing friendships and other social ties, there was little for the refugees to do in our house except seek comfort from the sharing of each other's partition violence experiences. This they did in groups which continuously changed in their membership as they shifted from one room of the house to another. The children were sometimes shooed out and sometimes ignored as gruesome stories of murderous violence were told and retold. It is sobering to think of hundreds of thousands of children over many parts of the Indian subcontinent, Hindu and Muslim, who have listened to stories from their parents and other family elders during the partition on the fierceness of an implacable enemy. This is the primary channel through which historical trauma is transmitted from one generation to the next as the child hears the note of helpless fury and, the imp and impotence in accounts of beloved adults and fantasizes scenarios of revenge against those who have humiliated his family and kin. These fantasies, which later sink back into the subconscious, dim memories get, get, that can get revived in contexts perceived to be similar to the Hindu-Muslim violence of the partition, are a vindication of the parents and a repayment of the debt owed them. Given the strong kinship and family ties all over the country, a Hindu's enmity towards a Muslim and vice versa is often experienced by the individual as part of the loyalty due to the parents and other older members of the family. Much later, I began to reflect on the healing of traumatic experiences, on how important it was to have family groups for individuals to be able to speak of their traumatic experiences without resorting to the defensive responses which I mentioned earlier such as denial, survivor guilt and so on. And how important it was for the children that the adults felt stronger and more in control. With children whose envelope of safety has been breached by horrific violence suffered by their group, our diagnoses and interventions are often guided by personal factors unique to the individual child as we seek to assess the child's resiliency to the trauma, the child's temperament, personal history, age and stage of development, level of anxiety, security of early attachments and so on. The kind of interventions we make with these children would shift 
if the resiliency of the child's group, extended family, community became the focus and not the individual child. We would then need to know the meaning the group attributes to the violence. For instance, whether the violence is seen as inevitable, a recurrent event in the group's history whose effects too shall pass, or as a one-time occurrence in which the group is singled out for divine wrath as a consequence of sinful behavior that needs urgent redressal. There are, of course, other meanings that different culture groups attribute to the violence. Our interventions will then be indirect, focused on the group's own attempts to cope with the horror and terror of the violence it has experienced. The emphasis then would be on strengthening the caretakers to strengthen the cared for children. To do so both sensitively and effectively, we not only need to know the stories a child's culture tells about violence, but also how does the culture dream of lives in and out of balance? How does the culture sing of meaning and of one's place in the universe and tell the story of individual and collective purpose and the hazards along the way? How does the culture go to the liminal edge of meaning that unsettles, perplexes and demand answers to that which will always be beyond us? Healing victims of collective trauma need not only an individual but also a community-centered approach. Thank you.